All right, guys, welcome back for another video. In today's video, I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin price action and touch on some uh, pretty interesting charts I found. Um, you know, it's been a lot of sideways price action in Bitcoin. You know, I'm still in the same long position I was from the FOMC meeting earlier in September, uh, you know, around September 20th right here. Uh, still in that position uh, and prices really just grinded sideways. I mean, there are a few price distinctions that are important. Um, one, you know, one being... Uh, this one right here, we took out the previous uh, weekly high, <clears throat> but we didn't get a close above. Um, although that is uh, important, you know, whether you're looking at daily or any time frame, really. Um, so something I want to keep an eye on. I'm still looking at this area to be uh, a base. I won't go into the RSI concepts and all that, but I will revisit price action a little bit. I just want to touch on a few charts here uh, that, you know, particularly caught my interest and I think are pretty important to understand. Now, when, if you're trading Bitcoin, you want to understand USD liquidity um, because really, if you think of what Bitcoin is, it's a uh, USD liquidity index. Now, you know, of course, Bitcoin trades against all other currency pairs. So I don't want to I don't want to fall into the trap of only considering a USD liquidity index, but it, it does tend to track USD liquidity more than other currencies. Um, and the chart we're looking at right now is the uh, Federal Reserve reverse repo facility. Um, and you can see uh, that that reverse repo facility is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you know, reaching all time highs. Um, it seems to correlate with an increase in the federal funds rate. Now, what the federal funds rate is, is the interest paid at an annualized rate, at, you know, overnight to these uh different essentially what the reverse repo market is is a short-term loan issued uh, from the fed to a, a bank um, to park capital there overnight and pay them an annualized rate prorated uh, for that 24-hour period now when you see a uh, reverse repo you know going parabolic like this basically what 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 you're seeing is you're seeing USD liquidity being drained from the banking system, right? <clears throat> that that the this cash, um, which is now in the trillions of dollars, um, you know, could be spent for real productive investments, or you know, into a real market. Uh, but instead, it's it's put into this imaginary market with the Fed, uh, and the Fed pays them you know interest rates with money that they don't have, right? So it, it, it's pulling uh, dollars out of the real economy. Um, so now the flip side is that if you ever see the reverse repo market shrink, and actually uh, today there was a closed door meeting for the Fed on October 30th. People on Twitter thought it was an emergency meeting. It wasn't an emergency meeting. It was just a closed door meeting. But following the meeting, the uh, reverse repo rates dropped significantly. Now this chart is pulled from a couple days ago. So it didn't catch that uh, that significant decline. That's something to keep an eye on. If you see that reverse repo rate um, drop, that's liquidity uh, being directly injected into the financial system. And that's liquidity injected without the Fed even having to buy bonds. So this is a roundabout way to inject liquidity uh, or do QE without you know anybody really noticing. So the Fed could create incentive structures for those trillions in of capital to flow out of the reverse repo market into the broader markets, effectively increasing liquidity in the trillions of dollars without actually purchasing a single bond, right? Now, of course, they can purchase bonds. That's within their power. But this would be a, a little more subtle way to do it, right? They could, uh, that's one way they could add liquidity and then claim with plausible deniability that they're not doing that and they're still trying to fight inflation. Um, again, I'm not saying that that will happen. It's just something that could happen and something to keep an eye on. Now, uh, the one last thing I'll say about that is that, you know, if if you are uh, trading Bitcoin, uh, what you want to focus on is uh, uh, dollar-based liquidity and other fiat currency-based liquidity metrics, not strictly the cost of capital for a lot of the reasons we mentioned before. Uh, and by cost of capital, I mean interest rates. Uh, real interest rates are still deeply negative. Um, you you want to 
kind of focus on the expansion of the money supply rather than simply the increase and decrease of interest rates. I know it's a little bit of a nuanced topic and I'd have to do a whole video for that. So let's just leave that there and move on. Here's kind of another illustration of, you know, that to me, this is a very, very important chart uh, because it just destroys the current narrative that that uh, is existing in Bitcoin, which is that, you know, interest rates in the United States are going up. Therefore, Bitcoin must go down. And, you know, there's definitely some type of corollary effect there. But I think what's happening is that people are applying causation where none exists. Right. So they say they see the prices decline dramatically um, since the Fed started raising interest rates. And so they have applied a rigid cause and effect to that uh, distinction that doesn't exist. And this chart is a great example of why it doesn't exist. Right. Because in uh, late in mid 2016, people forget this often in mid 2016, um, Price, you know, the, the Fed actually started raising interest rates. So they raised interest rates in 2016 into 2017 and then continued to escalate their interest rates rises into 2017. And what did Bitcoin do during that period? Well, Bitcoin uh, went parabolic exactly when the interest rates started to be raised off the zero level. Um, so, the you know, just this, this directly contradicts the narrative, right? You know, in order to believe that interest rates must make Bitcoin go down as a matter of fact, you have to ignore what happened during 2016 and 2017, right? And people will say things like, you know, Bitcoin has never undergone a period of rising interest rates. And it's just objectively not true. Uh, you know, they, they, they are discounting 2016 or 2017. Either they weren't there when it was happening or they're not factoring it i don't know but um this obviously disproves the narrative now i'm not i'm not trying to make an argument about what will happen in price action based on interest rates i'm just trying to you know take a shot at the narrative that you know if this happens then you know it, it's there's just not it's the problem is that there's they're implementing cause where there is no causation Right. You could have done the same thing with interest rates following 2016 and 2017, and you would have been wrong. You know, um, of course, the market doesn't work that way. Right. When we start to think in guarantees and, you know, the, and start to place a sense of certainty where there is no certainty, that's where we really get into trouble. Uh, this this graph here is the uh, U.S. government interest payments. It's just kind of illustrates the uh, magnitude of the debt spiral going on in the United States just by raising interest rates. Uh, you basically have interest payments already going uh, beyond the cost of defense spending in America, which is, if anybody's familiar with America's military, uh, it we spend quite a bit of money on defense. So for interest payments to be challenging that uh, is, is pretty extraordinary, actually. Um, you know, and and this is only with interest rates being elevated for less than a year. And remember, uh, as uh, different debt instruments and treasury securities hit maturity, then they're rolled over and reissued at the new cost of financing. So the longer that interest rates remain elevated, the more parabolic this interest payment is going to get. And then the debt, the, the, excuse me, the debt spiral just continues to spiral faster. Now this is the uh, this is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Uh, it's uh, fairly recent, updated uh, after the uh, previous FOMC. So you can see here, you know, in the the Fed has not reduced the size of their balance sheet significantly. Now in the July FOMC meeting, which is now almost three months ago, they used the term. Uh, the phrase, continue to reduce our balance sheet significantly. They use the same phrase in the September FOMC meeting, that they're going to continue to reduce the size of their balance sheet significantly. Well, if you just look at their balance sheet, they haven't reduced the size of their balance sheet significantly. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where they they say that and then people just kind of 
assume, I don't know, this is very public information. So I don't know how people don't go look at it and see for themselves. And when the Fed says things like that, ask themselves or ask them, hey, wait, uh, you know, you, you haven't reduced the size of your balance sheet. Now, I don't, I, you know, I've shared different uh, Fed projections before about uh, there's a really interesting graph where it had the Fed balance sheet in real time. And it also marked off their projections, like what they claimed, um, you know, their balance sheet was going to be. And their, you know, their, their balance sheet projections always fail to the upside. So, again, I wish I had the uh, chart up and pulled up, but it was very interesting. And, you know, you can see how there are multiple times in the past where the Fed has made uh, balance sheet reduction projections. And they're always, always, always failed to the upside. There's actually not one single scenario. Um, among roughly about a dozen different scenarios where the Fed tried to tighten, where they actually met their projections. It's just, so that's quite an edge when you have um, something like that with a hit ratio of 100%. Uh, so what does that mean exactly? How, how is that tradable? Well, we don't, we don't know exactly when the Fed will pivot or how they will pivot or what it will even look like when they do pivot. But what we know with a reasonable degree of certainty is that the expectations or the projections that are being priced in by the market are going, are, they're always going to exceed the reality, right? Reality is always going to fail to the upside, or at least it always has in the past with a very significant uh, probability of 100%. (laughs) Um, So that's something to keep in mind. That really is one of the, you know, aside from Bitcoin itself, again, this has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but this this thing is uh, very pivotal to my bullish bias in general, uh, different assets, right? Uh, you know, again, this is kind of my opinion. Now, there is a factor of statistical probability with what, you know, the projection uh, of the Fed's balance sheet in the past, but really what's pivotal to my investment thesis, my bullish thesis is just the reality that, you know, the market is pricing in more bearishness than, than, than exists in reality. And, uh, again, the balance sheet projections always fail to the upside. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult to time that, right? It, if you try to time that you're almost always going to be wrong. Uh, but if you can, you know, position yourself, so that, you know, when the balance sheet does fail to the upside, that, you know, you don't get blown out in that scenario is basically, basically the moral of the story. Now, this last uh, chart is just the U.S. GDP, uh, gross federal debt to GDP. I won't dive into that, but basically it's just an illustration of how leveraged the uh, U.S. government is. It's a good example, you know, people, today compare uh, current uh, market climate to the 1970s. Well, if you look at the 1970s and using uh, debt to GDP as an indicator of the leverage of the U.S. government, well, the U.S. government is, you know, basically five times as leveraged as they were in the 1970s. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, leverage... uh, Ha- occurs on an exponential scale, right? So if you're five times more leveraged um, and you raise interest rates, uh, you know, a very small amount, it's going to have an exponential effect. So you're really, um, it's really an exponential gain function. So uh, that being 5x leverage, it's going to, in reality, the mind doesn't really process that in the way that linear functions work. So it's best to think of it as being like 20 X leverage of what, you know, the balance sheet was in the 1970s. So the moral of the story is, you know, people make allusions to previous fed chairs, for example, Paul Volcker, who raised interest rates pretty dramatically in the seventies. Well, he did that, um, on a, a very low leveraged government balance sheet. Uh, so it's not the same. Uh, <clears throat> we're in different market conditions, uh, and, 
and it doesn't really apply. Really, the best uh, time period to compare to the current time is actually the post World War II period. Um, you know, anytime the government fights a war, uh, it expends an incredible amount of debt or issues an incredible amount of debt. And we just fought the war on COVID. Um, we're actually more leveraged than we were after World War II. Uh, anyway, going back to the price chart, let's see what we got here. Again, we've got a quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily open and close. So, yeah, all the way, you know, get your quarterly, open, monthly open, weekly open. Now, again, um, you know, we have multiple drives of weekly bullish divergence. Uh, depending on, you know, if you confirm this using a close, uh, then it's not confirmed. But, you know, if you confirm it by taking out the high, then you actually confirmed it on the prior week. Uh, so you get a pump above, run back down. And that's really, uh, really the base right there that we're working with. Now, I think... You know, whether if you're playing this conservatively, you know, maybe you're waiting for a daily close above this level. Who knows? But really, uh, this is the level to be playing, right? I mean, if you, if you are short, uh, this is really the level to, uh, you know, manage risk on. Uh, now, you know, at the end of the day, trading is just a range. You just trade different ranges, right? So, uh, we have a current range right here from 20,000 to 18.3. So, you know, I, I picked up an entry at the bottom of the range. Uh, somebody uh, who, you know, maybe had a short position at the top of the range. Uh, we actually can both be right if this continues to go sideways um, and we take profit and play the range. Uh, but ultimately, our areas are still very similar for our risk management, right? If, um, you know, if even if you are short from the top of the range, you know, you still still want to manage risk above the range uh, because then you get into a scenario where, you know, if, if price starts closing above there, then you get confirmed weekly divergence, confirmed three day divergence and things really start to turn around at that point. Um, and these, you know, really start to be considered uh, capitulation lows, in my opinion. Now, <clears throat> we did get this one short squeeze up into this area right here. Um, but if you look at the uh, what the moving averages were doing, uh, you know, a lot of times when you get this, uh, you know, the move, moving averages crossing and then expanding, you'll get a squeeze into them and then a rejection. And then look on the rejection, you get your squeeze here. So RSI divergence is starting to build on the daily, right? You get your first drive of divergence, it confirms. What as soon as it confirms, you squeeze the shorts, run up, but you know you get that first pass uh, fade into the moving averages, and then throw down, and then create another drive of divergence. So now you get your three drives of divergence. Now, what's different about this time now is that <clears throat> you know uh, if you get another squeeze, it wouldn't be the same uh, you know first pass fade that this uh, squeeze was here, right? Now the uh, moving averages are starting to slow, slow down. Um, it's not downtrending anymore. It's starting to uh, put in that divergence and base out right here. So basically, if you got another uh, squeeze like this, uh, what would happen is you know the moving averages would actually start to cross back over, um, and it wouldn't. You, you're unlikely to get this type of rejection, right? But of course, you know everybody's looking for what happened last. Um, so if, you know, you get another squeeze, people will, you know, be looking for this type of behavior. Well, you know, that, that never happens, right? A, a good example of that is, um, you know, the previous all-time high. Um, if we ever test the previous all-time high, uh, because the last test of the all-time high was a swing failure pattern, right? It threw, threw up above, took liquidity out, and then ran below. If we ever retest the all-time high, people will look for that same distinction, Right, just because they associate that previous moment with the current moment, which is a psychological fallacy, uh, but people do it all the time. And the moral of the story is that if we if we did do that, then 
the market will unlikely to do the same distinction twice just because everybody's looking for it. Anyway, I hope you guys like this video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, just subscribe.